Hi, I'm Etiqua Mortar, and today I want to talk more about my game, Etiqua's Room. It's the one right here, prototype. And as a quick test, I want to make sure that I have my audio connected correctly, so I'm just going to run the trailer and see if we can hear it. See if it loads first. There's something wrong with the audio here. So I see it here. Hmm. I'm really uncertain what it's capturing in the sound. So we're gonna figure that one out too. Properties, this should be built in analog stereo. That's what I'm listening to. My mic should not be on there. So when I speak, this should have absolutely no output because it's definitely not there oh, I was working before well, let's see how it works now it's quieter that's just silly um, do, 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 do. always problems with live streaming right everything goes wrong but I want to talk about the audio anyways and I gotta make sure the audio is actually working and so it's done something clearly wrong there Let me check the audio, audio, audio. Do, 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 monitoring, audio monitoring. Yeah, so this should actually be, there's something definitely wrong there. Let's just remove this one. All right, so talking makes sense. Now, if I add another one, so audio capture, Audio output captures what I want. I do that. And the device I want is my built-in analog stereo. Okay. And now there's no audio there. So this is clearly an OBS bug somehow. And now if I play over here a video a sound, let's just restart this one. Now you Do you like audio. puzzles? And you should be able to hear this. Do you it's want to escape? Do you want to escape? Would you trust Wendy with your life? Assemble your team and come to Etiquois room. Alright, but that should be good enough. Let's get this one. Play a prototype. A collaborative online escape game. Longer. So this is the website. The game is an online escape game. And today I'm talking about the sound. I wanted to get the sound working because there's sound in the game. So if we I have a couple of the games open right here, and this is the first game. And this is how it looks like. This is live. And if you click on stuff, not everything generates sound, but it's here. So this generates sound, and it does an in-world event. There are a few other sounds you can have in here as well, like I'm going to pick up an item from here, and then you get that sound as well. There's a few more like locked sounds, and these are sort of environmental sounds. They come up on every single screen, so they always have to be there, and they're preloaded, and I'll get back to that in a second. There's another type of sound that's um, customized per the scenes, and in this game, I have the keyboard, and there's sounds on the keys. So these are not environmental sounds in the sense that they're only specific to this screen. And in the game, I have them encoded on just this screen because we don't want them everywhere. I don't actually ever unload them because they're small enough and they're going to be in the browser anyways. And there's not many in this game, so I didn't worry about it too much. It's kind of fun if you click them a lot, they produce this weird ambience. as much. That's enough playing with that. And this game, this first one has no music and that's something I wanted to add to the second one. And so I want to look a little bit at that today as well. What, what happens in the second one, how we do that with the web audio. And so this one when we start the game starts like this, and I'll explain why this envelope is here a bit later. It has to do with the feedback from the web audio. And so, this one has music. It's not very long, this one is. 
sounds comfortable when called Zap. Zapsplat provides sound effects, and I have, I think, all of mine from there, even though short music clips come from Zapsplat. I have the gold account, and I grab them all from here, and they're an excellent source of such sound effects. And I have a lot of cartoony ones. I'll let you sort in that. So I have cartoony sound effects, and I also have those musical ones. <clears throat> so this game has music, and there's more music to this. So that was just the first screen music. And now to get to the second screen, I'm going to have to show you how to get by this first screen. And I'll just quickly do it, and you can figure out in the game why you do it that way. And that's another one of those sound effects. It's an environmental one when you solve something, you can figure it out. This is a minor thing to solve. It gives you a figure it out message. Then we can go in. It. Now the main game sound starts here. This is the music. It's a bit longer track. And with these longer tracks, because they're not, or because this is really like an active track, we don't want it playing forever. So when this one ends, that two and a half minutes, it will not restart. It's not moving music. As much as old games are definitely music, it gets kind of annoying. And the sound is also a lot quieter. And I will be putting a volume control up here, or just be able to turn off the thing entirely. I do have a debug panel where I can turn the volume on and off, and we'll look at that in a little bit as well. So these are all the sounds in the game, and I want to look at now in the code how we actually set up the sounds. What the main problem is. And I'm using basically web audio. This is the HTML web audio stuff. And now I'm just Pause this in Firefox, and I use this a lot while developing because I don't necessarily want to listen to all my sounds repeatedly over and over and over. So now I'm going to, so like I said, I'm using web audio. Web audio is kind of like a toolbox full of a bunch of things you might need, a bunch of things you don't need, and missing some things that you actually need as well. Each of those things I showed you are done slightly differently. The two sound effects are the same. But let's start with them. Let's start with the basic feedback. When you click on something, like this guy's head. All right, I gotta turn this back on. Actually, I can go to this one so it doesn't have the head turned on. So, this one makes a sound. It has this popping sound. This is the basic sound. So let's go to my, oh, let's, let's go to the game code. I'm already around there right now. This is a source and it's in the, in the logic code and a sound file is where most of it. Sorry, it's in the layer code. Layer is where I keep all the platform dependent stuff mainly. Although, of course, the UI layer is all React, so that's also platform dependent, but it's a very special layer. And so sounds, it's my sound layer here. And let's switch the schema to stream so everyone can see this nice. Oh, let's not switch it to stream. I haven't figured I gotta fix that again. All right, so I hope you can see this. Should be clear enough. I use big fonts. Everybody yells at me for big fonts, makes fun of my fonts. So it should be big enough for you to read. And we have these sounds. And the main sound function is one called load sound. A load sound loads a sound. But this is preloaded from down here. Preload. And I have these theme sounds. And I can open up the theme file just to show you what's in the theme file. So themes. Each game has a theme, and the theme defines, and it has nothing to do with the game, the actual theme of the game, it has to do with the UI. And it defines what all these buttons are, the colors of these buttons. I should say colors, but it defines the entire button and the pop-up screens and all that, as well as the sound effects for that game. It's theme. In theory, I could switch it out, but I won't switch it out. As long as I'm doing cartoony games, I'm gonna have the one theme. If I do a different type of game, like a more scary one, a more serious one, then I'd switch out the theme appropriately and to have different style buttons. So they come in here, this theme file, these are all the things that have to be defined by the theme. And the sounds are at the bottom here. And so the indicate is the most generic one. That's when you click something. And then there's the ineffective locked. Locked is when you do it, solved when you solve. And these are all the various sound effects. There's not very many in the basic game, and that makes sense. Because there's only so much feedback. As the game advances and as I build the engine more, I might put more. But there's a caveat here as well. You can't add too much to the theme 
because then everybody has to load this. And as a web game, it gets bigger and bigger the more stuff you add. So I always watch that as well, so it's not so bad. And let's go back to where it loads the sounds. So the preload function lists the sounds in the theme that it has to preload. This is actually a full path at this point, and it just loops through and says load sound. Now in web audio, your basic sound loading is way down here. Ah, this decode audio data. Let me jump back up to the top first because context is important. Where does context come from? Audio context is something like this. It's window.audio context. If you have Safari, you do WebKit audio context. Presumably this fall, they'll update it. I don't support Safari anymore because they have other defects that I couldn't work around. So right now I'm only Firefox and Chrome. If I ever want to go back to Safari, um, I'm going to check out the release that's coming out this fall and maybe they fix some of the bugs, but one of the big ones they probably haven't, so I won't do it. But in any case, we have this audio context. This is just part of HTML5 or whatever they call it now. And then you have to create a context, new audio context. And so everywhere here I have this audio context now. And I track everything with the sound bit. I love using the word bit when I don't know what to call something. It's related to the sound. It's a bit of thing I need for the technology. The web audio part is the audio buffer. You'll notice it's or null. This is everything done in TypeScript. If you haven't seen that so far, I'm doing TypeScript. So everything has types. I prefer the type safety. I'm doing this project in pure JavaScript it would have been insane. The TypeScript compiler has helped me immensely in tracking down things. And then the buffers, so these are all the buffers I have open. The record, record, record of string, and sound bit. And so the load sound. Let's jump over the first bit and go down to here. The actual loading. If you're just loading this in your own code, this is the most important part of it. You create the HTML request. Now, Web Audio, this has to be manually managed. You have to say where am I getting data and how to load it. This is good and it's bad. It's good for these small ones. It's not a big deal. And you can load it from multiple things. You could actually split out a whole bunch of sounds from one file. It's going to be bad when I get to the music. And we'll get back to that why it's bad with the music later. So create the request, get. You should be used to this thing. Just set array buffer here, response type. And just override this. Just go with it. And set the on load and then do a send. When you get the data back, and this will be all of the data. This won't be streaming. This will be all of the data you get back. And for these sound effects, this is perfectly fine because they're small enough, they're not very large files. And then we're going to do context, and we're going to decode that audio data. We give it the response, and then what happens with the buffer? In typical JavaScript fashion, these are all like these async functions, what happens here and there, here and there. Um, some of these might be promises, and some are not. So some of them are going to have the then syntax, and some won't, so I just can go this way. So we have this buffer, and it's loaded. Nowhere in here do we have to say what type it is. We're hoping the server gives back the right type or it auto detects. These are all MP3 files. And so I have a bit and I just set the buffer and the loading status to false because I'm done loading. And this comes back to the loading up at the top. Now let's go look at that part. This is my part of it now. This was the generic HTML aspect of it. And now my part. So if I want to load a sound, first thing I do is I get the buffer for that path. And I base it on path just so it's unique there. Although all the same sounds will always have the same path. It's not like the game is going to produce the same sound with a different path. And this path is going to be a complete URL. Okay. Now, if it already has the bit and it's either buffering or loading, we're just going to return and say, look, we're done. It's already loading. Stop requesting this again. And the reason this can come up is not for the preloaded ones. Well, it could, <clears throat> but for the ones I load on demand, if you try to activate them before it's done loading. Okay, so now we don't have a bit. And notice I check if there's a buffer or loading. There's a chance that something fails and the loading doesn't finish. So if it actually gets a stale bit, it's going to redo that. And the ref bit here is also gives a second name to it. So it can use it for multiple names, but you don't have to worry about that very much either. Now I create an empty bit at path. There's a path loading as a sound bit. I'm not clear why I had to put as sound bit here. Sometimes TypeScript gets a little bit annoying for me. 
Ah, uh, yeah, because I'm using the bit down here, and when it disconnects like that, sometimes it loses a type. So I set it in the buffers, the path, the bit. And also, if there's a second reference to it, set that as well. I have to do this in two places, because if you call this again with a second name, you have to set the new name up here. And this just gives it the multiple names to track what's going on. This is just an engine later. It's not relevant to the actual sound loading. So then I load it. So now I have this loaded sound. Great. And since I preloaded them, that's all that happens. So I preloaded all these sounds, and I have sounds. But now you actually play a sound. So when you click on this, it produces a sound. This doesn't, when you click on this, because this is a high level, and I'll go just another show, this is the SVG stuff. I've written this, this has an on-click handler. This sends a message to the UI layer, to the game layer. Eventually, that message ends up at this play sound function. And this play sound function looks for the path. And if it doesn't find that, it says it's not loaded. This could actually be a race condition and loading scenes. Like I said, when you go into this scene here, the first thing it does is load those sounds. And if you happen to click a button before it's done loading those sounds, it'll actually say, look, it's not loaded. And this is tough to deal with that. Well, what do you do if it's not loaded? Should you produce a sound or not? And the thing is that if somebody clicks on this, they click, and then four seconds later it produces a sound, that's really bad feedback. So you, either you want to produce the sound right away or kind of not at all. And this is a bit difficult to deal with. And this is more important for the music. I'll get back to it. There's an issue with that there. But here I preload, and it's small enough you don't have to worry. And most of my things, all my sound things, I give this visual feedback as well. Because I don't want to have sound on to play the game. So there's always visual feedback. You can turn off the sound and you can play the game. And I'm not going to tell you why this keyboard is making animal sounds. If you want to play the game, you can figure that out. It's part of the puzzles. And obviously, there's a sequencing of animal sounds you have to make. So that says console error. Um, I've seen it a few times, I do, but it rarely comes up because it loads fast. And so the next part of the HTML audio here is, well, how do we actually play the sound? Well, once we have the context, this is our main global object. This is audio context. We call create buffer source. And create buffer source creates a buffer source. Very obvious. <laughs> and you have to set the source buffer to the bit buffer. The bit is my object again, and the buffer is what I loaded with the decode audio data. It gave me back a buffer, and so I stored that. I stored this buffer, and now this is the bit I want to play. I am unsure why I can't just pass the buffer in here, create buffer source, whatever. Now I have to connect it to a destination. There is a default destination, and that's all I use in this game. I do not create any other destinations. I was going to get into making different destinations when, when I was doing music, but something went wrong with music. I'm foreshadowing a lot to something being wrong with music, and we'll get back there. As you connect it to somewhere, and then you start it at location zero. Good, and that starts playing the sound. Now, each time you do this, it creates a new buffer source and plays it. That may sound a bit inefficient, but it lets you overlap the sounds, again, to produce that weird ambient moving sound. <laughs> So each time you do it, it creates an overlapping sound. And you might be asking, well, but don't I have to clean these up? Like, I'm accumulating lots of them. Like, every time I press a button, <laughs> and that's correct. But you notice this source, this reference here, it disappears at this end of the function. So I'm not keeping a reference to it. And since I don't have a reference to it, these things also tend to auto clean up. If it's playing, there's some reference somewhere in this context. This connect, this start, it's creating a reference inside this context somewhere. So there's a reference held to it. When it's done playing, and since I don't keep a reference around here, that object will eventually be cleaned up by the JavaScript garbage collection engine, probably scanning, or it might be automatic. I'm not entirely sure. I don't know when the buffer itself is removed. But since the buffer is created from something I have in memory, I'm assuming this buffer source is also a tiny object, and the web audio engine itself 
track stitch. So even if this wasn't cleaned up for a very long time, I don't imagine it's a big deal. So that's how the sound effects are played. But what about, those were the generic ones. So we saw how I preloaded these ones. I preload, and this has to do with this ones in the screen here. There's another locked one as well. If you go here, you can see locked, and that's the locked sound effect. Again, I always have the visual feedback to make sure that you don't have to have sound on to play the game, and also because it's nicer. You also notice with this locked effect, when things shake, you can see behind them. I thought it was a nice effect. I left it. Could have fixed it, but I think it's interesting that you can see stuff behind it. In theory, you might be able to click and get the stuff, but I was never able to, so I'm not positive if you can or not. And again, the pickup effect here, if you pick something up, you get a sound effect as well. And those are all the preloaded ones. So what about the non-preloaded ones? Back here, these are not preloaded, and they come from a data file. And I'm going to have to show you my game file, how that happens. So this was in, I have a games directory, and that's part of prototype. And these are broken up by region. And so this is the living room right. And the living room right has something called the synthesizer. And the synthesizer has a sound section. These sounds go into that. The sound, sound, sounds, bird sounds. So bird, cat, cow, frog. And these just point to the directories. These are in the storage directory in a static directory. And the theme will create the full directory for these. And the engine then says, well, when do these actually get loaded? Because this is just my data file. These data files are compiled and shipped to a file that's sent off to the client when it loads. While I'm here, I can show you that, that each of those keys on the screen have an SVG ID associated with them. So you click on it. It has a sound associated with the sheep. And that's going to play the sheep sound. And it also has the action to show, sh to say, roll over sheep. That's the one that actually tracks what key you pressed. And I'll get back to an episode about puzzles, so how the puzzles are actually managed. And then the feedback message it shows to the ba. The little speaker there that you see is nothing special. <laughs> I use emojis throughout the game. Emoji I'm just using to qualify as any Unicode thing that has a colorful icon with it. Colors are nice for quick things, can be a problem for other things. So I have the sound section. Where does that get loaded? Well, that's actually a good question. <laughs> in my source layer, in the layer, I have a scene loader. And I believe it's loaded in there. I haven't done the loading in a while. The scene loader is what loads the entire, both the SVG and the data. So let's look for sounds here. So somewhere in this file, when we load a scene, this scene is the thing we're loading, and I'm looking at sounds object of it. And I'm going to look for the sound URL. It has a name, and I'm going to call load sound. This load sound is from the sounds thing. So load sound. You notice preload called it, and load sound. So we're just effectively doing exactly what the preload did now. In this scene, we're calling load sound. It loads the sound and preps it to be used. That really means, though, is that every time I go into this scene, it attempts to load the sounds again. In the sense that it always ends up in this load sound function. And it's always going to find it, though. And so it already knows. It says it found the bit. And it says, oh, it's got a buffer. So I don't have to load it again. So just return. So it's just going to keep returning and returning and returning. And that's not much overhead there. And there's really no other way to do it. And that also ensures that if I do actually unload the sounds, which I might, that when you go back here, it'll load them again. And even if I unload them, they're probably in the browser already, in the cache. So they'll be loaded fairly quickly. And so that was in the scene loader. For the scene, I load all of those. That in the game, when it has to go, say, play the sound, there's a play sound function too, but I have a quick one for feedback here. It'll play the sound. It'll end up in that audio engine playing the sound. So those are how the basic sounds are done with web audio. And again, with web audio, is the main key parts are here. Create your audio context. Do window audio context, new audio context. Let's create the context. Everything's done in that context. And then you're going to set up your XML HTTP request, load the data, then decode the data, and stick it in a buffer. When you're ready to play the sound, you create a buffer source, 
set the source of it, connect it to your destination, and start it. That may seem like a lot to play a simple sound, but it's really not very much. It's a, it's a reasonable use of the engine. Every one of these steps has a very strong reason for doing it because they don't all have to be done the way. Every one of these steps could do something slightly different in your game or in your application. So it makes sense to have each of these. Now when we get to music, what I was hoping for with music is basically the same thing. I'm going to create some sort of streaming source and do it. And the Web Audio API actually says stuff about that streaming. So let's do a media stream, or I should do web audio. I can't type today, media stream. So create media stream source. This sounds delightful. This sounds like exactly what I want. See here, I created a buffer source. Now I want to create a media stream source. This sounds like exactly what I want. But there's a problem with that. Now let's go back and show where I needed that again. That was when I played sound in here. It's probably gone long enough it'll play the sound again if I come back here. So it's playing the sound again. Again, I had a timeout that the length of the music, when it's done, it waits at least two and a half times the length of the music before it'll play again so it doesn't get too much. But I've been talking long enough now that I'll play again. So it, I'm kind of using web audio for the sound for the music, but not really. So let's cancel that. Because in theory, I just wanted this. And I said, all right. That seems simple because once I have that object, I can just connect it and start it. Perfect. But the problem is, how do I create the stream object here? And the stream object says, well, it's a media stream. All right, that sounds perfect. I need a media stream. All right, how do you create a media stream? Um, I don't know. There doesn't seem to be a constructor here. The constructor just takes nothing. It takes either a uh, empty thing or a media stream a different one, or an array of tracks. All right, but there's also an add track function. Where's add track? Add tracks right here. And you can add a track, oh great. So I can add a track to the media stream. Okay, I don't know why I need to add more than one track, so we can add tracks. So I go here, media stream track, and it's like, okay, I can add one. How do I create one? Do you see there seems to be a constructor missing here? I can't seem to create a media stream track. So that seems to be a problem. I can't create one of those. Every one of these platforms I support, Chrome, Edge, and all these things, they all seem to support them, but where do you get them from is the question. And I'm still something, I'm still missing something here, or it's incomplete. So what I did instead, I said, okay, we're gonna go with a more traditional approach. We're going to go back to the HTML audio element, first of all. And audio is technically part of the Web Audio API. So I created a function called play music. And I'm going to skip over my weird bits first and get to the important bit here where I create a music bit and that plays it. And up in the music bit, in my constructor, it takes a path and it creates a new audio object. Audio is of type HTML audio element. I actually kind of dislike this in TypeScript that the types of objects are distinct from the object constructor themselves. It's kind of annoying at times that why is this audio and this not audio, uh, whatever. So once you create this audio object, I set the volume to my global volume, which is starts at 0 0.6, and then I press, then I start play. This is a lot simpler to play sound this way. This doesn't have to be music. This could be any sound. And at first you might think, well, why don't I want to do it this way? This is really simple. But I need more control over the sound. I may want to fade it in. I may want to fade it out. I want to start and stop it somewhere other time. This audio element has a very rudimentary interface. If all you need to do is play some music on your page, go for it. Use it. If you need to do effects on it, well, you're out of luck. You can't do effects on this. You can't do any sort of control, dynamic effects or like even fade in and out. And that's where I started hearing problems. The rest of this stuff I have here is to track the status of it. So when I first create the audio object, I listen to a bunch of events. The events I'm listening for are play, playing, and the duration change. I don't actually use all of them, but there is a reason I watch them. They may go back and forth. I don't remove it all the time. 
And so I add an event list and on events, the key ones I want is on duration change. I want to know how long this is. You can't just look at it because it's dynamically loading it. You don't know how long it is until it started loading it. If it's an endless stream, this could be infinite. If you change the source of the audio element, which you can do afterwards, this will change again. Right now, I just want to track it. So in my music bits, sound similar to sound bits, I track the duration. I just started at zero. And when the sound is done, I want to say when it stopped. So I know when the music has stopped playing. This is important for when I track new sounds. So let's go to the new sound bit when I play music, because I don't want to play music twice. So every time, this might still be playing. Every time I go into the screen, I attempt to play sound, but you notice it didn't play this time. And this is because of the timeout I have on it. It's done playing, but it's not playing again. So when I play music, it's going to play the same path. So this screen here, we can actually look it up, has a path for it. And this is in the game's carnival. And this is the ticket booth. The ticket booth has a source sound of sounds music ducky. This happened to be the name of Zapsplat ducky something, so I just stuck with it. So in sounds, now what do we do? We have play music, and this is going to say play path ducky. Scan music bits. What is scan music bits first? Well, scan music bits looks through all the bits, looks through all the ones that are done, and just erases them and says, oh, well, they're gone. We don't need them anymore. And this is a because we don't have to worry about one bit sitting around all the time, I just do that each time you play new music and just to get rid of the old ones first. If there are bits left, I return because it has something playing. And music shouldn't play if there's already some music playing. Later, or as I intended, this is supposed to get more complicated first. Now I look at the last music bit. And the last music bit is actually set at the end of this function for whatever music's playing. If the last music has a stop or has duration, it returns. But we never get into this return because of this return up here. If it's a music bit, well, then it's not going to be playing. But I have this double safety mainly because I was planning ahead that there will be multiple music sources playing or music bits. Not necessarily proper music, but music bits for sound, ambience, and stuff like that. So I have two things here. Don't let the music play if there's actually a music bit playing. Now we get into the timeout here. How long has it been since that last music stopped? And that's our elapsed time. And then I check for the minimum elapsed. Minimum elapsed is how long should we wait before playing next sound? And there's two options here. If we're playing the same music as the last one, if the paths are the same, then we'll wait two times as long as the last one. So if the last one was two and a half minutes long, we're going to wait five minutes before we play that music again. This prevents one track from playing again and again and again and again. This is suitable for the type of music I'm doing now because I'm downloading stock music that has some repetition to it. It's very um, tiring music. And when I say tiring music, it's not something you can have in the background. It's kind of active. If you were composing a more of a score to your game, a full soundtrack, you wouldn't need this timeout, but you'd also have much longer periods of time, like you'd have full 30 minutes that could loop. The moment you get to even up 10, 15 minutes, you can loop the sound because you won't hear those repetitions, unless, of course, there's repetitions in the sound. But since I'm using stock music, I'm doing two times the duration of the sound. If it's a different music, I wait 30, 30 seconds. And that's enough. 30 seconds then says, look, if there's even two different music sources, this prevents flip-flopping back and forth with the short ones, but also says, give the user a rest. Give the users a rest. They don't need it the whole time. So if the elapsed hasn't been long enough, then we return it there. And this one's actually not following my convention. So mini laps. Let's save that. So how do we play the bit? That's what I showed before. I create a new music bit from the path. I push the music bit, and I say, less than that music bit. And that tracks that for me. And then it's just the web audio. The constructor is actually what starts playing it. Starts playing now. I have a catch statement here. And this one is actually used. This one really comes up a lot. Because what happens if you first load this page? Like I just press reload. If this page attempted to play music right now, it would throw an error. It would Even if you played any sound right now, it would throw an error. Because this is a restriction for HTML that the page can't produce sound until the user has interacted with it. 
Now, in a way, you can kind of understand this, but as a platform, that's just a stupid requirement. I mean, it's just stupid. You're trying to build a generic platform and you want to encourage people to do apps and stuff in it, but you can't have such restrictions. Clearly, the users loaded this. And when they get here, they may have come from another screen of mine easy. And there's no way around that. And it becomes bothersome. And so mainly that's what this catch is catching. But then, well, ah, so you notice I clicked on it and that starts it. Let me show you how that mechanism works. So that's what I was going to get to. Source UI. And this is in my music interface. This is actually um, a React component I did here because it was the easiest way to hook it up into my system. I'm going to reduce the size of my window here just a sec. You see it? So I have this music component in React. And all it does is connect a bunch of other components together. It connects the state, data, the scene, and some global data together, and then does a bunch of effects with them. Most of the work is done in the music listener. And with React, I can just use use memo, and this will create one listener and it'll keep it for the entirety of the game. And then I have the listener object. And the use effect once, I'm going to subscribe. And the subscribe is going to watch for UI events. But it turns out I didn't use that, and I should probably remove that. What I'm looking for here is the scene, context game use, use game state. This is how I watch the state of the game, and I say I'm only interested in the local scene. So this component will update every time the scene updates. And this is this effect here. When the scene updates, I am going to call switch scene. And the first thing switch scene does is it asks, can I play? And can I play because I'm in a music listener goes up. And the first default is can I play starts at false. No, you can't play. So when this constructor is created, we check. We say we can't play. Then we add a mouse and listener for mouse down. And I call it interactive. I could have had other events, but mouse down is the only one that consistently indicates the user's interact with the page. And so when the user interacts with the page, I remove the listener, and then I say can play equals true. So now we can actually play music, and the user has done something on the page. If there is a pending event, I start playing it, and then I say it's no longer pending. And back at the switch scene, you also see this play here. So if I already can play, I play it immediately. And play then, as the scene doesn't have music, it just returns. You know, I could have put this right in the switch scene to avoid the overhead of pending, but it's a trivial overhead, it doesn't matter. If the scene has a music source, then it plays the music. The game asset function converts the name path to the correct location, whether this is the CDN or just my surfer, with the version number as well, and it plays the music. And that can only happen if they've interacted with the scene, and that's because of the restriction of browsers that until you've interacted with the web page, you may not start audio playing. Stupid restriction for a platform. For, pri for annoyance concerns, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. They should have solved it other ways. In this music component, I also have a global volume. So if anybody changes a volume, it turns the volume up and down here. And there's other ways to connect this, but I'm all used to using React, so I models use the state-based React system. So that's it. It plays the music. It's probably still playing. It's done. It hasn't played again because of the timeout. Eventually, if I do that, it'll play again. Okay, but there's a problem with this pending thing. So I set this thing up that said, look, if you go into a scene and you want to play music and you can't, well, just play it as soon as the user clicks. But there's a problem with that. If I load this, not for, so I load the scene, it's silent. It's a bit weird, right? It's fine. You'd expect the music to start. Now, if I click on something, now the music starts. This creates a false association because it's like, well, why did the music start when I clicked his head? It's supposed to be C music. For most of the game, this is an issue. But it comes up at one place in particular, and it had to do with the starting screen and why I have this envelope. So the idea is when the game starts, you get to start using it. It's supposed to come up with and this was the starting screen. So this was the starting screen of the game. You would come directly here, you're supposed to play this one music, and then you start playing the game. However, 
when you land just directly on this page, and I can reload it and see, this is how it would start before, and you don't get the sound until you click something. Now you get the sound, and that's just weird. It creates this false association that helps the sound have to do the music. And now the one you like, oh, well, do I really want to touch this other stars? Is it going to turn on and off on me? I don't know. So that's exactly why this game, as a quick workaround to that, has this envelope here. This is sort of a pre-first screen, and when you click on something here, it's enough for the browser to say, hey, look, you can actually start playing it now. And then it plays the music the moment you start it. The other way to solve this is I have a warm-up screen for this stuff. I can actually, there's a start screen with instruction stuff that's all HTML that leads to this JavaScript page. <clears throat> what I could do instead is I could put that lead-up screen directly in the app, but there's a lot of reasons I don't want to do that because they're kind of disconnected. This is all playing and stuff. There's also a chance this would work if I have just some start button, but that's already really weird because I already have a start button in the previous screen. So this solution isn't perfect. This game, it works out fine. You just start in silence and have this question mark, and I think it works fine here. And then you click the button, and then you get the sound. And so I think here it works so... I only have to solve this one game right now, so I'm not going to look for more generic because I have more pressing concerns with this one. Sound effects that are not music. So once you get into the game, and I can go back to the first one we had. Once you're in the game, you notice the sound started at the wrong time. Okay. okay. Once you're in the game, what I want is along with the sound, I want the sound to fade out, and then I want to have people laughing, like a group of people coming around, laughing, making noises, the children in the swings making sounds and stuff. So just the general ambient noises you'd expect from a carnival. This requires things to fade in and out. And it's like, okay, great. How do you fade in and out? So I said, well, if I have a media stream track, there's something called a game node. And a game node, as soon as it loads, a gain node is perfect for that. A gain node lets me control the volume in a linear fashion or an exponential fashion. I specify a new value and it goes up and down. Perfect. All I need to do is, because we had that media stream, I just need to create that sound in a media track, hook up the context, add a gain node, and then I can control the volume. Except there's no way to create a media stream track from an MP3 on a server. The only option I potentially saw is having to load it entirely on the client side. So that was, in particular, let me just close this one here. Otherwise, If we go back to the sound file, this was in load sound. The way I loaded sound effects, I can load the music the same way and decode it and then play them the same way. But that's not what I want because these are going to be larger music things, and I don't want to block the game. I don't want to have these things sitting in memory. They're longer tracks. Maybe I have a five-minute track. These should stream, and the audio element itself will stream them, and you can even look at the network connection of the browser. It does stream them. Even if it has the ability to download all of it right away, it does stream the audio elements on the page, which is exactly what you suspect. And, But there's... And so there's this media stream track too. It's like, okay, great, that must be able to work. But there's no way to create one from an MP3 unless, and I was getting hopeful here, HTML audio elements. What does this have on it? Not a lot. It just has, it's just an HTML, it's an HTML media element. And it has audio tracks. I'm like, oh, 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 this sounds good. Because what's an audio track? An audio track might have what I want in it. This might be a media source I want, but it's completely irrelevant because audio track's not supported. Even if you look down at their little browser, audio tracks here. It's experimental in Chrome. It's experimental in Firefox. Experimental in Opera. I don't know why they all marked as experimental. Like they all universally agreed that this is an experimental feature. Yet it appears to be the only way you can get the audio track from the audio element. So what that means is that I have absolutely no way 
to attach to my MP3 file and stream it with the Web Audio API. There is a way to actually stream Chunk's live data. So if you wanted to do a live server with a podcast or video and stuff, you can actually stream that live. And that would have audio, I think, but it might only be video, I didn't check. I didn't check because in order to get that working, now I have to go through the setup. I have to create a server that's gonna stream it with the real-time protocol. I guess it's an RTP protocol that can actually stream an MP3 from my server. Um, I have a simple Flask server right now. Maybe I can do it, maybe not. I'll, I'll look at it. Maybe a content delivery network can do it. And then on the browser side, well, then I also have to like manually chunk it because nowhere in this Web Audio API have I found a way to actually talk to an RTP server that would actually stream it for me. Because none of these elements, none of these buffer tracks offer me a way to specify a URL. So I really have no idea how it's supposed to hook together here. There's no examples of this online of how to stream the MP3 file. There's no more documentation about it. So now I'm stuck in the state that I can't build a proper ambience engine. And it's like utterly ridiculous that this is in this state, but okay, we deal with it. So what can I do instead? Because obviously you've seen sites before that fade music in and out. Well, I could use JavaScript to animate the volume. Well, that, that makes sense. I turn the volume up and down, it gets louder and quieter. It sucks because then you have an interval of the timer and then you have actual quantized steps to the volume that your ear can pick up. But if the music's active enough, like the stuff I have, you may not pick it up. So I said, well, let's do that approach. Let's see if I can actually turn the sound on and off. And so I actually took that approach. Here is the volume, adjust volume, or fade to. I have a fade to function. I have experimental interface for this. I fade to, and I'm going to create an interval, and then on the interval, each step of the interval, I'm going to modify the volume. So let me go over to Chrome here. I'm going to switch, and you'll understand why I'm switching to Chrome for a second for this one here. Let's grab this one here. We can go back here. This is a multiplayer game, so you can all share the URLs. Each user is in a different state of the game, but you share the items and stuff like that. And see how, see, this is already software. Let's go to F12, the debug interface here. I have a debug interface in the game. And I also have something called toggle the debug panel. And that opens up this really high quality panel over here. And I have things like music and fade in and fade out. So let's, let's play this music here. Oh wait, I had to wait for the timeout 30 seconds. <laughs> because it just played music, I now have to wait for play music for the timeout, um, or I could reload the page, re-enable the panel, but it should be timed out right away. So this is just a test track. It doesn't do much. And I can fade it out. And I can fade it in. I can fade it out. Fade it. I mean, it's not perfect. You probably can't hear the quantization on this track. It, it is there. And they may actually have internally linear fades on it. So when you adjust the volume, it has a small ramping effect. So you probably don't notice very much. I, I change it very slowly over two seconds as well. And that would be fine. Except it doesn't work in Firefox. I mean, it does work, but it's broken. So in Firefox, let's open up that same panel. Show. All right, no toggle. Toggle debug panel. Now we have the debug panel. We can play the music. Um, oh, I have it muted. And we can fade it out. I don't know if you hear that or not. Every time I adjust the volume, there's a click. So you end up with noise. Uh, I really hope that's coming through in the stream. And that's every time I change the volume. So this interval here, if I reduce the interval, I'm just going to make it the most extreme. Let's just do the most interval we can possibly have. Reload that. Get the comma back. 
now you can hear all sorts of noise. There's deep, this is clearly a bug in Firefox. It cannot possibly be with Linux as a whole. It has to be something in Firefox doing this because Chrome works. I have OBS that does all sorts of sound processing, no problem. I use music production on here. I do other games, I do videos and stuff. And so this is 100% a Firefox defect. It's an unfortunate defect though because I have to live with it. So what that means is in Firefox, at least on Linux, Maybe this doesn't happen in Windows. I don't know. Um, I have no way to fade music out. I cannot fade music in and out, and that just sucks. Um, and there's just no way. The web audio doesn't have the correct interfaces. The audio produces noise. And so that's the state I'm in right now. And it makes it really, makes me question whether I want to put more effort in right now into producing the ambient sounds. They would really be nice but if I don't have a way to fade things in and out, this is a problem. I do have one option where I can actually manually fade the ambient sounds in and out, and I might do that approach. So if I have children laughing and stuff, I'll actually make that track fade in and out, and I'll just never loop it. It's not so good, but it might actually work. But if I can't have continuous looping sounds, it's not so good. And if I can't stream correctly, I can't have longer sounds. So I'm kind of in a stuck state in this. And if anybody has a solution to this, I'd really, really like to know it. Um, preferably one that doesn't involve me creating a streaming server, because that also sucks, because then the user won't buffer the sound. Ideally, I just want to have a way to hook into the browser's existing streaming mechanism of audio and say, hey, look, stream on, stream off, fade in, fade out. Very simple things. And I'm really shocked that they're not available. But I'll move on. I have some basic music, and that works. So the game has music, and that's the main thing I wanted. And I've done you a tour now of how all of these audio comes through. We have music, we have sound effects. 